Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For those who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pensions. The idea with this webinar series is to invite guests who have a unique point of view that can help us improve pensions. And today we're going to meet with Jakob Benheim, and he's the father behind the InfoGap theory. The interesting thing with Jakob is that he's not a pension expert, but he's working with severe uncertainty in financial markets in many other applications. So I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion for people interested in pension, but also if you're not in the field of pension, I think you can learn a lot from Jakob today. Also, the setup of the seminar is that we're going to have a conversation for half an hour, and then we're going to open the floor for our questions from the audience. And if you hear something in our conversation, I want to know more about that. And Jakob, I really want to drill down on it. Please type already your question in the chat function, which you have to the right. And that will actually help us to sort of come back to your questions and answer them after our conversation. So with that, I would like to welcome you, Jakob, to Pioneer Pensions. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. I remember we met, must have been five, seven years ago in Rotterdam, when you walked me through the InfoGap theory, and it kind of left me a memory. Uh, I was thinking about it quite a lot. And then when I saw you coming out, this one, uh, I really read it and enjoyed it. So anyone in the webinar, if you want to know more about this, check out Jakob's book. Uh, Jakob, I was thinking about, before we jump into sort of uncertainty and then talking about how, how we can deal with that. Uh, can you tell us a bit how you got into this topic? How did you get interested in uncertainty? Yes. Um, as a young academic, I was working on the problem of assessing radioactive waste, which was distributed in large containers. And you know nothing about the spatial distribution. And the question is, how do you design a measurement? Uh, when you do not have probabilistic information about what you're trying to measure. And this gradually got me interested in problems of deep uncertainty, and uh, the rest is history. So what was your aha moment when you were digging into this? Yes, um, I would say that there are two aha moments. Um, one is, uh, you know, I'm trying to describe uncertainty without knowing a probability distribution. It's sort of like trying to describe the outcome of rolling a dice when you don't know many, how, how many sides the dice has. So you need some other tool, some methodology for representing this uncertainty, something other than probability. And the first aha moment was the idea that if two possibilities could occur, this possibility and that possibility, then anything in between could probably also occur as far as I know. So the idea of a convex set, the collection of one point, two point, and everything in between, the idea of a convex set, like a circle or an ellipse, to represent unknown possibilities was the first important insight in the development of InfoGap theory. Um, <clears throat> And the, the second um, was that um, one really can go beyond, one can appreciate the power of probability as a mathematical tool and also recognize that there are other mathematical tools. So um, that um, the plurality of mathematical tools for representing and managing uncertainty um, was the second um, big point of entry that led to the development of InfoGap theory. Could you explain to us or summarize what is InfoGap theory? Yes. Um, well, the, the, first, um, the first idea in responding to adverse uncertainty is to recognize that you need to identify what is an essential or critical outcome. You need to identify what is good enough or what the economist Herb Simon called satisficing. 
you need to identify what is a satisfactory outcome. That's in distinction of uh, imagining what would be a wonderful or the best possible outcome. And the reason for that is that the more ambitious your required outcome is, the more vulnerable you are to adverse surprise. There's this irrevocable trade-off between your robustness against uncertainty and the quality of the outcome that you can confidently achieve. So um, the first and probably most prevalent concept in InfoGap theory is the robustness function that quantifies this trade-off between immunity against adverse surprise and confidence in achieving critical or essential outcomes. The second, more briefly, is that um, surprise can be um, favorable, beneficial. There are uh, wonderful surprises. And the second decision function in InfoGap theory is the opportunist function, and it addresses the question, how can we uh, benefit or exploit favorable uncertainty? So those are the two main uh, decision tools in InfoGap theory, the robustness function and the opportunist function. And I was thinking about this, because when you're thinking about a problem, it can be very sort of well-known, um, then you have very little uncertainty, or you can even be faced with radical uncertainty on the other extreme. And I assume as long as you're somewhere in between, this tool is very helpful because it helps you put sort of a, a, a understanding, a metric on, on the uncertainty. Could you give us an example on how you use this in practice? Say, for example, in construction or something like that. Right. In, in um, building a bridge or building anything else, on the one hand, we have lots of experience. People have been building bridges and houses for thousands of years. On the other hand, um, we use new materials. We uh, use new um, construction methods. And um, these can be uncertain because we're unsure about these, the characteristics of these new materials or methods. And um, so, in, in um, planning or implementing a, a construction project or any kind of manufacturing project, we're using new materials whose properties are imperfectly known. You want to, you want to formulate the robustness question. You want to identify what might be the limits of your knowledge. For example, you don't know the rate at which cracks will emerge in this new material. And you want to ask yourself, how wrong can my current understanding be? And the uh, product, the, con the construct, will be uh, satisfactory. That is the robustness question. And um, <clears throat> in designing and implementing any kind of project with a new material, you balance the robustness against your ignorance or uncertainty or unfamiliarity with the new material uh, against the uh, performance requirements that you need. How long you want this to last, how long it needs to be independent without supervision, and so on. So the robustness tool is essential for integrating what you do know uh, with what you do not know. Thank you, Jakob. I was thinking about this robustness function and how would you go up? I understand the concept that is really good to understand how robust am I, but how do you proceed in, in sort of defining that in, in more sort of a practical example? How, how do you actually define the robustness function? Right. Well, there, there are three components that one needs to consider. Um, first of all, your current knowledge your models of whatever the system is, whether it's an economic system or a material system or a medical system. Um, your first set of uh, concepts is your knowledge and your models of the system and context that you are concerned with. Um, the second component in formulating a InfoGap robustness analysis is uh, your performance requirements, as I mentioned before. You need to identify 
what what are the outcomes that need to be achieved? And at this stage, one needn't be um, modest or um, uh, fearsome about identifying outcomes. You need to be um, forthright in identifying what are the outcomes that need to be achieved. And these can be very ambitious outcomes. Modern society, um, uh, innovators in modern society are ambitious. They want to do uh, better than the other guy, much better than the other guy. So knowledge and your models, your requirements, uh, your performance requirements, your outcome requirements is the second component. And the third is, um, what what is it that you don't know? Um, as I mentioned in material, uh, the material example earlier, you don't know the rate of crack formation, or you don't know um, how future political events that you don't know what they are, will alter uh, economic aspirations and intentions in the economy. So you, you want to identify categories of potential surprise. So models and knowledge, uh, performance requirements, and uncertainties. Those three components are combined in evaluating um, the robustness to uncertainty, which then prioritizes alternative options an option that is more robust against your ignorance will be preferred over an option that is less robust um, to, to your ignorance. Thank you, Jakob. And I think this is very close to something I spent a lot of time with is scenario thinking. And I think that's kind of a very important input variable into the InfoGap theory. An area which I am very intrigued about, and you mentioned it as well, is innovation. And mm -hmm. It's such an exciting topic because you can be a firm, you operate in the market, all of a sudden the market is changing for whatever reason, and then you have to respond to that. And if you're an incumbent, you might say, how can I be defensive of my existing business? And if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to say, how can I get the opportunities out of this? And in that kind of world where your reality is changing, it could also be like changes in pension policy and, and stuff like that. How would you then go about to apply for gap theory? Mm -hmm. yeah, there, there, um, surprise can be beneficial or adverse. And um, the, um, the conventional uh, firm may view innovation cautiously. Conventional firms are not going to be opposed to innovation. They'll want to improve, but they'll be cautious about it. They will ask, what are my critical requirements? And um, ask how to defend against adverse surprises that can accompany an innovation. So an incumbent firm uh, may tend, um, not necessarily, but may tend to prefer a robustness analysis. Asking how immune am I against adverse surprises in order to achieve a, an increment of improvement. The entrepreneur, on the other hand, might say, hey, I don't have anything to lose. Let's exploit the new surprises that are inherent in an innovation. And we'll use the opportunist function uh, to ask the question, um, what is the smallest uncertainty that I need in order to enable a wonderful outcome? And this, this opportunist question is very different from the robustness question. The robustness question you remember um, asks, how much uncertainty can I tolerate and still have an acceptable outcome? The entrepreneur, the, opportun the opportunity seeker will be asking, among different options that I could implement, which option would uh, flourish uh, better than expected at the lowest level of uncertainty? How can I choose an option that will thrive even under ordinary circumstances. That's the opportunist approach. And uh, the individual uh, decision maker, innovator, uh, will choose where he is on that spectrum between robustness against and protecting against adverse surprise and opportunists from and exploiting favorable surprise. And what I like that, Yakov, is that if you're going to be successful think about in innovating in the pension industry, you need to strike a balance. If you're too afraid or, or too robustness seeking, you might actually not be able to be there. 
but on the other hand, you cannot be overly opportunistic either. So you need to strike a balance and find the one that's right. Joko, when, when you've been working on other problems, because I know you've not been working in pension, but you have a wild experience from other areas, have, have you applied this to something when you were exploring something new and, and innovative? How, how, how did you look at this sort of an opportune perspective? Right. Uh, well, one, one example was um, in collaborating with people at Los Alamos National Laboratory a number of years ago. Um, there, um, they were developing a new material that for which they had great ambitions that it would be much, much better than the materials that they were currently using for whatever it was. And um, the, the question then was, and the big uncertainty was, the material that they were developing, we're developing it in, in a laboratory context, and we're not really able to test it in a real life situation. Um, anyone who knows what goes on at Los Alamos might understand why that is. But anyway, um, they were uh, developing a new material in a laboratory context, intending it for use in a very different real world context. So th there's, there's the uncertainty, the big gap between my nice, clean, quiet lab and this raucous world out there. And um, the, the, the question then was, what kind of tests do you apply to the new material in order to ascertain or verify that it um, will live up to expectations out there in the real world? So the tests had to be in part ordinary material tests. You know, Is it strong enough? Is it flexible enough? Is it whatever have the ordinary mechanical properties? But you also had to test robustness against alternative environments. You had to uh, try and identify how uh, resilient is this material to changes in situations that it will confront. How robust is this material and its properties to uncertainty in the environment? And that's a totally different set of tests. Uh, it's a different mind frame for testing and developing a new material. So that, that was one example that uh, Response to your question. Ah, so thinking about this, because our previous guest, Dr. Samir Sinha, he is a geriatrician, a doctor specializing on, on older people, and he highlights a big problem in Canada where individuals could make a choice, but they don't. They are not really interested. And it would be interesting to think about how would you apply the InfoGap theory to address the problems he describes. But Instead of me repeating his question, let's hear what he had to say. So let's roll the tape. My question um, for Yakov would be really about a challenge we have in Canada right now. And it's this idea that while Canadians can start taking their Canada pension plan and Quebec pension plan benefits you know, early, um, uh, we know that the longer they wait, the more they delay the age of claiming you know, from say as early as 60 to as late as 70, they can actually have more safe and secure um, income. The challenge is, is that less than 1% or about 1% of Canadians actually take advantage of that benefit. They wait till 70. Most take it early on. And the, the it all makes sense as to why you should do this, but people don't make that decision. What are the, the mix of, you know, kind of boosts and nudges that we need to actually do to help people make difficult financial complex decisions. Yeah, well, um, first of all, um, my response will be methodological rather than substantive. That is, I'm not gonna say, oh, what you should do is start the pension at age 62.5. No, my, my, my response will be, a methodology that each individual would apply um, depending on his or her personality and preferences. So, uh, and, and there are different routes, as you can already imagine, either the robustness against adverse surprise or the opportunist from favorable surprise route. And the individual has to ask himself or herself, um, what is their inclination? Um, and are you concerned about uh, guaranteeing critical requirements? Or maybe you're very confident and um, 
are interested in um, achieving better than anticipated outcomes in the um, advanced years of your life uh, based on the pension benefits that, that can be acquired. So the first methodological de decision is between robustness against adverse surprise or opportunists from favorable surprise. And then you need to ask yourself, well, what the, the individual needs to ask themselves, um, what, what are my requirements? Do I want um, to assure a basic minimal requirement that will allow me to proceed in an ordinary manner? Or am I more ambitious and I want to try and to achieve a better than anticipated financial future? Um, robustness or opportunists? And then what are the uncertainties? How long I will live? How healthy I will be? How financially independent I will be under the different alternatives? These are uncertainties that you don't answer because you don't know the answer to those questions. Um, but then you ask yourself, well, under the various options, am I more robust with uh, to my ignorance, to my uncertainties? If I choose an earlier or a later option, or if I'm in the opportuni opportunist uh, frame of mind, can is there more likelihood that I will exploit favorable uh, alternatives if I uh, choose this option rather than that, that option? So again, it's identifying um, the individual's inclination, uh, protect against surprise or exploit surprise, identify the individual's knowledge about themselves and their context and what they require or aspire to, and then manage the uncertainties uh, that surround that knowledge. Um, and as you mentioned, um, my most recent book from a few years ago might be useful to people who are interested in pursuing this in greater depth. Yeah. Thank you, Jakob. And when I'm thinking about this, it's an interesting way that the mythology is quite similar to what people apply, but take uncertainty into account. So what you call so opportunities is sort of the risk reward, and then you have so much you know, security do you want on the other hand. So I think the industry is thinking in these terms, so this is not completely new, but what I like is the introduction of uncertainty into the equation and actually have to think through what could happen. So perhaps the process is more important here in order for you to define your decision as an individual rather than anything else. I was wondering about this. I was thinking like, let's take the leap back into finance. And I'm thinking like also when organizations thinking about a business plan, you have what I call a bean counter somewhere. They're the title controller, they're, they're in charge of a spreadsheet and they create KPIs and that kind of stuff. But it's also assuming that this is pretty much a linear process that you can fit in a spreadsheet. And that assumes you get a, a correct description of the world when you start. And if that's wrong, well, your model not gonna be of much help. How do we avoid people getting stuck in their models? Yeah, well, I think one um, important element is um, an element of humility. Um, you know, we, we have lots of people acquire lots of experience, knowledge, understanding, and they develop self-confidence. And that, of course, is important um, because without confidence, you can't take responsibility for your decisions. Humility is, is an important element here. And I don't mean humility in, in a moral sense, although that's important in other contexts. I mean epistemic humility. We need really to recognize um, that we're living in a very complex, multidimensional, diverse world uh, in which um, there are many, many things that we do not know. And um, we need to recognize that despite our experience and understanding, we will be surprised in some situations. And then we need to prepare ourselves, um, not just emotionally, but methodologically for dealing with that uncertainty, either by robustifying against the uncertainty or by exploiting the opportunities that uncertainty presents. That would be 
my initial response to to that question. I was also thinking it was Amory Lowens who said that a model, a bit paraphrase, a model is a good companion, a bad boss, and a terrible religion in the sense it's good to help you structuring the world, but if you blindly believe in it, it can take you down a very negative path. Um, how, how do you deal with that? How did you deal it if you want to make it? How do you deal with that situation when you're, when you're faced with a model that sort of is very easy that it become a law rather than a tool? We, we, we need to recognize our knowledge for what it is. Um, let me put it this way. Um, many things that we know today, we didn't know yesterday or other people didn't know yesterday. So um, our knowledge grows. Um, but uh, recognizing that our knowledge has grown um, leads us immediately to recognize that our knowledge will continue to grow. In other words, there are many things that we do not know uh, that tomorrow, today that we will know um, tomorrow. Um, I, I'm reminded of this wonderful quote by John Wheeler um, that we, we live uh, on an island of knowledge surrounded by a sea of ignorance. And as the island of our knowledge gets larger, the shoreline of our ignorance gets longer. So we, we, have, we, we become more knowledgeable over time, maybe even more wise over time. But as our knowledge grows, the opportunities and the potentials, the interface between our knowledge today and our knowledge tomorrow becomes longer, more complex, and, and more vulnerable. So that increasing knowledge um, should instill us with both an element of confidence, but also with an element of humility. As our knowledge grows, the shoreline of our ignorance gets longer. In practice, I run across a couple of people in decision positions, and sometimes I wonder I have a feeling that it's very convenient for some decision makers to be willfully ignorant. And what I mean by that is if you have a complex problem and you have a simple model and you believe in the model, then you don't have to think and do all this difficult stuff. So it's actually helpful not wanting to solve the problem in a proper way. I think it was Upton John Sinclair who said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. So uh, I think there is what I see as a big challenge with turning this into practice. So how do we help decision makers to make better decisions for the beneficiaries and, and show them that, you know, maybe taking a shortcut and be willfully ignorant could be a really bad thing? Yeah, well, first of all, let, let me say that um, almost all of my experience um, with decision making in many different areas, economics, engineering, biological conservation, national security, other areas. My, my experience has been at the level of the analysts, not at the level of the administrative or executive decision makers. Although, um, and, and so um, interaction with those um, high level decision makers is not my specialty. Although I have had some interaction, um, <clears throat> uh, for example, a number of, uh, over a number of years, I collaborated with economists at uh, <clears throat> the Netherlands Central Bank, the Netherlands Bank uh, in Amsterdam. And my collaboration was with economists in the analytics department. Uh, but we also met um, at least once with um, the then president of the, the Netherlands Bank, um, and, and it was um, not an analytical meeting. We didn't explain equations or show him graphs, but we tried to interact with him in a way which would um, convey a sense of confidence on, his, on our part um, in the uh, bottom line uh, prioritizations that we were uh, proposing 
for the consideration by the president and his uh, executive committee. So uh, in, in, the, in the meetings with the president, the, the, the focus was not on the technical details, but on uh, the nature of the process in a more abstract sense. Um, how successful it was in communicating with the president, um, I guess you have to ask the ND, DNB people. Um, but, uh, but certainly this interface between the analysts and the executive decision makers is um, a very uh, challenging interface. And you're saying if you get the analysts on board and are able to understand they, they have a good chance of influencing their decision makers. I was wondering a final question before we open it up to the floor. When I'm thinking about the concept of risk is pretty common in the financial industry and particularly when you talk about pensions. But then many measure risk as the short-term volatility around the trend, which probably doesn't matter that much if you're investing for a very long time period. What matters if you get the trend wrong? So how do we deal with this sort of you're measuring something that doesn't really matter but the thing that really matters isn't measured how 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 would you sort of how do you reflect on this right um is a very uh, central question in info gap theory and in in other um, tools for dealing with uncertainty and um certainly in an in an economic context the the central a concept that is, or central distinction, was made by the economist Frank Knight a uh, hmm, long time ago, more than a century ago. Uh, Knight, uh, Frank Knight distinguished what he called risk, which is a probabilistic entity, what you referred to as uh, variations around a trend. Um, risks, probabilistic risks, we generally understand fairly well because we can look at the short and long-term history of that variation, develop probabilistic models that are useful for characterizing and managing uh, those probabilistic risks. But then Frank Knight uh, identified or uh, identified what he called true uncertainty. True uncertainty, and this is Knight's term, is not probabilistic. True uncertainty is those big surprises that you don't know are going to happen tomorrow morning. Um, they can be... Um, economic innovations or technological innovations that impact a the market. They can be political changes. They can be wars that break out um, or wars that end. Um, these true uncertainties are things that we're not able to um, identify a, a, and characterize fluctuations around a trend. These true uncertainties, Frank Knight um, identified as um, central in economic analysis and in many other areas as well. And InfoGap theory focuses on the, the Knightian true uncertainties, um, modeling and managing uh, the boundaries of your knowledge. Um, and the robustness and opportunist functions are methodologies for um, achieving that um, response to Knightian true uncertainty as opposed to Knightian risk. Thank you, Jakob. I think that captured very well on, on how you can use InfoGap theory and also, quite importantly, how you can use it when you're thinking about pension and you're thinking of pension product and innovation in pension, developing post-retirement products. I think this is a very important factor for everybody to think about, and particularly policymakers when they also think about how to create a better pension system for people. I have a question here in the chat from David. It says, in pensions, I can envisage that this is a useful insight for thinking about how to deal with uncertainty faced when member of defined contribution schemes reach retirement and when they are deciding what to do with the savings. Is the main insight that you should decide what is most important to you and plan from there, taking into account where you can and cannot deal with change. I, I think that's a, a fair statement. And I the, the point that I would particularly emphasize um, is 
that one needs to, um, when facing adverse uncertainty, one needs to identify uh, critical or essential outcomes rather than engaging in um, uh, aspirational thinking about what may, might may be a wonderful outcome. What do I need in order to be satisfied? Now, what you need to be satisfied could be very ambitious. I, I'm not insisting on um, modesty or, or um, abstemiousness, no. But you need to identify what level of outcome, a financial outcome in, in that particular case, is, is essential, is critical. And then, um, and that's in distinction to trying to optimize the outcome. What is an essential outcome? And um, to the extent that the essential outcome is less than optimal, you now are able to optimize something else. And that's the robustness against your ignorance. So satisfice the financial outcome. Ask yourself, what do I need? Um, and optimize your confidence in achieving this essential outcome. Optimize the robustness against surprise. And Yako, I think the, the good importance here is what we learned from Sinise as well. It's not just the financial side. You need to take your social um, you know, connectivity into account, your physical health, and, and look at it from that perspective. Because if you just optimize one part of the equation, first of all, you can't optimize it because the world is uncertain. On the other hand, it might be your, your wealth might be the most important part. Health might be the most important part rather than your wealth. And social connectivity is also really important to set up. So I think the good here, what you're saying is figure out what's important and trying to say, get your satisfying approach rather than a optimizing approach. We have another question from Chris. He says, surely given the fiduciary responsibilities of trustees, the robustness approach is the only viable option for a trustee board, question mark. So you have a bit of a context there. If, if you're a trustee, you basically are looking after other people's money and therefore sort of, you probably should focus on the robustness function rather than the opportunist function. Right. Um, so what's your take on that? I, I guess I would agree with what Chris said, um, but I would stress that it doesn't um, make, uh, it doesn't relieve the trustee of uh, difficult uh, judgments and decisions because he's still got to decide, he or she must still decide um, what level of financial growth is um, expected or required on the part of um, the people for whom I'm the trustee. Um, the, the decision still needs to involve identifying uncertainties that threaten achievement of those goals um, and um, then robustifying the trustee needs in the decisions he makes in managing uh, the fund, um, robustifying against uh, adverse uncertainties. So um, yes, I, I think that I agree with Chris's, my, my answer to Chris would be yes, um, but that doesn't let the trustee off the hook. It just points him in a particular direction, the direction of the robustness function rather than the opportunist function. And if you then would be a regulator thinking about how would you make sure trustees are making the correct decision would be to say, well, if you do have a model, have you really pushed that model and see what are the uncertainties involved? Because you can make it very easy for yourself or, or very complicated. And I think here is sort of the challenge for many is that exploring the robustness function, taking uncertainty into account, is a very difficult thing to do. It requires a lot of thinking and imagination and guts to actually do it rather than just following a model and say, I did it according to the model and therefore it's good. Yeah, and I think the regulators should look also at um, the methodologies of the people uh, that the regulator is regulating not only looking at the product, but what conceptual tools are they using to make the decisions that they make? Um, and of course, my recommendation would be they should use InfoGap. 
Um, but there are other tools as well, depending on what you know. Yeah. And I think most of these tools are based on a similar approach that you need to start thinking about what other stuff I don't know, and then you need to put them in a context. We have a question from Jordan. It says, is it possible for pensions with a vast amount of capital to turn uncertainty into certainty through the investment choices by intentionally investing in the favorable surprise category? Uh, that's a sort of technical question. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm competent to answer. Um, my feeling, and it, the question seems to be bordering on moving from robustness to opportuneness, um, <clears throat> whether that's a good move for a pension uh, manager or not, I will leave to the pension managers and the regulators to describe. Um, but I, I, I think that turning an uncertainty into a certainty is um, uh, science fiction, not, not reality. Uncertainties are going to remain uncertain. What you can do with uncertainties is manage them. You can make yourself robust to them, or you can try and exploit them, but the uncertainties are still there. It's, uh, InfoGap robustness doesn't remove the uncertainty. It, uh, it manages it. It makes us it protects against us. It protects us against those uncertainties. But the uncertainty remains. And that means that there are going to be surprises, not all of which will be um, um, felicitous. I think if I would flip Jordan's question around a bit, he could say, well, if you then have a lot of capital and you have 30-year investment horizon and you're exposed to the uncertainty of the future and you invest in equities, you're probably going for the favorable surprise approach, right? So at some point you could say, if, if you do have a long investment horizon and you think that sort of, you know, bad news can be followed by good news, should you intentionally then think about favorable surprises rather than the downside risk? So this might have thing, something to do with what we talked about the short-term volatility versus getting the trend right? Yeah. Um, if, if you have long-term, then certainly uh, diversification is a useful tool and adaptive diversification so that you, you adjust things as time goes by following favorable trends. Um, um, and if when one has a long time horizon, then one can... Um, pursue uh, the opportunist uh, channel to some extent. Opportunist is not opportunistic. Opportunist is saying uh, uncertainty can sometimes be favorable. And when you have a long time horizon, that gives you a potential for uh, pursuing uncertain possibilities. And um, <clears throat> that, that can allow... Um, uh, recovery from adverse outcomes and exploitation of favorable outcomes. Unfortunately, things are not that easy, right? So, but yeah. I think it's a good it's a good thing that actually got me thinking that, yeah, as a trustee, you probably have to think in both dimensions because for those who are near retirement, you probably have to think more in a robustness perspective of people from who has a long time to retirement. You can think in opportunist perspective. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Chris here. It says, the regulators emphasize the importance of prudence. And I think when you worked with a Dutch regulator and you talked about the tools that you were discussing with them on how to better supervise things, uh, I mean, prudence, how would you put that? It's, it's like a legal term that everybody talks about. Everybody's prudent, right? But how do you translate prudence in a world that is uncertain? Well, the, fir the first um, um, point that I would make in the context of prudence is epistemic humility. Uh, let us remember that we know lots, but we're going to know much more tomorrow. In other words, there are a lot of things we do not know today. Epistemic humility is the first component in prudence. Um, then the second component, I, I, I think, in a, a prudent approach to managing anything, 
a, a financial entity or an engineering design or a complex bio environment um, <clears throat> when when it is is an, is a robustness approach where you identify what are your critical outcomes <clears throat> what is your current knowledge and uh, what from what directions can surprises come you, you don't identify the surprises because surprise is something that you don't yet know but what are the directions from which you could be surprised? And then you combine those three components, knowledge, requirements, and uncertainties um, to identify the robustness of uh, the various alternatives. And this identification can, in some situations, be a quantitative identification, get numerical analysis. And in other situations, it's a qualitative analysis where you identify, you, you evaluate robustness in, in conceptual terms. I'm not going to go into the methodology, uh, but it's in my book, so you're welcome to read it. Um, <clears throat> you evaluate robustness based on probing the options with different uh, concepts like resilience and redundancy and um, flexibility and adaptivity and so on. So um, <clears throat> what are your goals? What do you know? And what do, from what directions could you be surprised? Yeah, that's really good because actually redefining prudence into that, I think, would be a very good exercise for most regulators to think about because it's going to force everybody to think a bit further. And I think this being humble is really important because the only thing we know, the more you learn, the less you know. It's, <laughs> it's my experience. So as soon as that's you learn, a lot of new knowledge open up, you realize you don't know so much as you thought. I think yeah, was, there's John Wheeler's comment that yeah. um, as the island of our knowledge grows, the shoreline of our ignorance gets longer. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. No, no, I think it's perfectly true. And, and one real life example from my student era, I did this kind of basic course in law. And, and I thought, like, oh, wow, I, I really know everything about law. And then luckily I didn't pursue that any further. But if I would, I probably realized I didn't know anything. Um, so it's always when going into a new field and get the first course, you think you're like, wow, I understand it because you get the simplified version. Then when you start digging into it, it becomes more and more difficult. David has a question. It says, thank you for your answer. Uh, we see a tendency to try to meet too many diverse needs. Satisfying against very limited essential outcomes makes sense to me. And I think what he's trying to say there is in much when the industry trying to help someone, it quite quickly become, I say, very detailed and, and trying to cover everything. And therefore, it's not that helpful. Is that your experience as well? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I would agree with David. And, um, <clears throat> on, on the one hand, one um, often has requirements in different categories, several requirements. Um, <clears throat> that that one needs to address, but uh, certainly um, in a situation where one's uh, ignorance is prominent, trying to get very very detailed is missing the point. We we need to focus on the key elements uh, because the little details, the fine requirements, the the marginal aspirations these are going to be lost in, in the dust of our ignorance. We need to focus on the critical issues. And it doesn't have to be only one. There can be several. But let's not get tangled up in lots of little details because we don't know enough to do the little details. And Jakob, that now I'm going to go down memory lane. I remember when I was a young student did engineering physics, we had to do experiments in physics and we had to calculate the measurement errors. It was just basic, you know, standard, how, how calculate, do an experiment to figure out the gravity. And then you're going to say, how do we measure uncertainty? And you quickly realize the variable that you were least familiar with, or which has the biggest me measurement error, if you wanted to improve your results, that's where you need to put your effort. The stuff you know reasonably well, there was no point making that more precise because what you don't know, dominate. Uh, and if you want to figure out something, you have to go for the biggest one. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. 
It's funny how everything comes together when you talk about theory, even like physics and pensions, you think doesn't have a lot together, but from a mythology perspective, it's quite close. I was have a question for you as well. I was thinking like, you've been doing this, you applied it to many different fields from finance to biology to, you know, uh, security aspects. If you're going to give a recommendation to someone who says, I'm going to work on a problem, it might be anything from launching a new pension product, thinking about how to invest, or, you know, just want to start their own startup. What are the recommendations you would like to give to them uh, how to deal with this when faced with uncertainty? So a bit like, you know, your three, four top tips. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I suppose, um, first of all, if I, I would ask the person to consider uh, their uh, what frame of mind they are in in approaching this new venture. Are they looking for um, um, wonderfully surprising, uh, better than anticipated outcomes? Are they looking to, you know, knock the socks off of their competitors or their mother or the world? Or are they looking uh, more for a more conventional um, um, state of the art sort of improvement on current practice, whatever the, the domain is. So the first, and then that, that bifurcation is between, it generates a bifurcation between how one views uncertainty. The first person whose aspirations are for surprising the world with a wonderful um, development would move towards the opportunist side and would view uncertainties as favorable opportunities and ask how to uh, exploit those favorable uncertainties um, efficiently. The, the second category, which is more state of the art, would view uncertainties as disruptive, as disadvantageous, and um, would uh, use a robustness approach to protect against those adverse uncertainties. Once that bifurcation is uh, decided upon by the individual, uh, then the appropriate methodology follows, whether it's opportunist uh, or robustness that one uses uh, to organize one's knowledge, identify one's uncertainties, and identify one's uh, goals. Thank you, Jakob. That's what very wise words. And since I'm in the field of liking to improve pensions, I thought a lot about how can we solve the accumulation or sort of the spending phase of pensions. I will bring this with me when I'm thinking about addressing those problems. But now you've been answering all our questions. So I thought it was time for you to ask a question to the next guest of Pioneering Pensions, and that is Lisa Brücken. She will come on April 25, around 2 p.m. UK time. And Lisa, her background, she's the director of Netspar, which is a very well-known Dutch pension research institute. And she's also a professor in Maastricht. And her focus area is on communication of pensions. So how do you explain this pensions to ordinary people and, and get them to sort of understand what's going on and understand the concept of uncertainty as well, because, you know, your pension isn't what it used to be, it's going to be impacted about a lot of things that can happen in your life and in the markets. So what kind of question, what would be your question to Lisa? Right. Yeah, the, the question that I would um, like to pose is um, a question of communication. You know, um, uh, Lisa's a professor, I'm a professor, professors profess, you know, they, they lecture. We, we can talk without end, <laughs> right? Uh, but the question then is, how do you communicate to an audience that is um, not trained technically to deal with the issues that you want to transmit? 
This, this is uh, a critical question when one wants to make the transition from the analytical to uh, the decision-making stage. And um, that decision-making stage might be uh, a bank president, but the decision-making stage might be um, the, the ordinary homeowner, uh, the man on the street or the woman on the street. Um, how do academics, how can academics explain their ideas to people who don't have the technical background? And this, for me, is a perennial issue. I, I, um, I teach students, of course, but I also try and communicate with the broader community. And it's a continual challenge. And anything that um, um, Professor Bruchen could um, um, provide, any insights she could provide on how to bridge the gap between um, the technical domain and the domain of everyday life on a communications level, this I think is very important um, for me as a professor and I think for many professors. Thank you, Jakob. These were very wise words. Um, I think we come to an end. We spend a full hour together. It's been a pleasure. I would like to thank everyone in the audience for participating and thank you for your questions because the purpose of these webinars is for everybody to be able to ask their questions and we're going to discuss that. And also I would like to thank you, Jaco, for coming and talking about the InfoGap theory, which I find amazingly interesting and underutilized in the world of pensions. And I think we, if we can do more with uncertainty in making better decisions and be open that we actually don't know that much and then quantify that, that will be an amazing step forward. So Jaco, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. My pleasure indeed. So with that, I um, would thank everyone. And I hope to see you next time when we're going to meet with Lisa and then hear her addressing Jakob's questions. And until then, have a good uh, week and a good month. Bye.